Good afternoon. Hello, Gorky, please. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting all my life to say that. <laughs> um, no, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here uh, in this beautiful, beautiful fall afternoon, right before our break, too. So I know there's a lot of both work and temptation. So I appreciate everybody taking the time and coming. Um, for the Department of World Languages and Cultures and for the Graduate Program in Latin American Studies, it is truly an honor and a privilege to have with us here today Dr. Lazaro Lima um to deliver a keynote lecture on the latina heritage month so we have had other events on campus uh and this kind of we hope it's a conversation um to kind of wrap up many of the things that we've been talking in our classes outside our classes with the students and other colleagues um, so as some of you know, Dr. Lazaro Lima is the E. Clairbone Robbins Distinguished Chair and the, in the Liberal Arts and Professor of Latino Studies at the University of Richmond. His work centers on the political emergence of Latino forms of civic personhood and the attendant institutional, juridical, and cultural industries that enable Latino democratic legibility and participation to emerge in civil society. Selected publications include The Latino Body, Crisis Identities in American Literary and Cultural Memory, Ambientes, New Queer Latino Writing, and Losing Sonia Sotomayor, An American Life After Multiculturalism, which is forthcoming and we are eagerly waiting for. Uh, Dr. Lázaro Lima is also the executive producer of the documentary film Las Mujeres, Latina Lives, American Dreams, and the director is actually, co-writer and the director is actually here with us as well. Um, so Carrie Brown, for those of you who don't know her. And uh, Dr. Lima's research and scholarship has been supported by many institutions and foundations, including grants and awards from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the American Library Association. He currently serves as the University of Richmond's Associate Provost for Faculty. Thank you so much and welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to be here because I had the opportunity to get to know a lot of the faculty at AU when I was serving as a visiting fellow at the Center for Latin American and Latino Studies. And the community here in DC expanded for me in really significant ways and included both the opportunity to meet my dear colleague, uh, Carrie Brown, who's really been instrumental in my thinking through how to talk about civic participation in ways that reach a broad audience, and not the sort of books that I've been writing up to the point, which maybe get cited by a, my friends, but uh, that don't have the sort of uh, impact that I would like. But foremost, I really do have to thank uh, Juliana and Brenda and all the colleagues in your department for making this opportunity possible as I get to share with you some of the intellectual quietudes that have me thinking through how best to think of democratic action in a moment that is completely impoverished in the political sphere about the nature of national belonging, who counts, and fundamentally, what are the conditions under which we can emerge as political subjects. I want to begin with a couple of disclaimers, uh, if I may, and that is that when we speak of Latino or Latina identity negotiations, I'm speaking about a necessary fiction. The idea that there is ontological presence related to what in deliberative democracy we consider political emergence is highly problematic and marks a sharp distinction between the wonderful work that student services must do to support all students, and in particular underrepresented students, from the methods and the theoretical concerns that become part and parcel on how to ask questions with far more nuance than we're accustomed to. Our political culture begs for this at this moment, in this moment of continuous sound bites that begin to delimit nuance for expediency. And what I'm trying to do with this project is to think through uh, a new uh, book project that will hopefully bridge the academic to uh, public divide in, in ways that might be useful. And the tentative title for the project is Broken Things, 
toward an aesthetics of disrepair. I begin with chapters relating to bone, flesh, body, and systems. This particular version that I'm sharing with you is precisely about education as a practice of freedom, which is one of the lofty contributions of American political philosophy from John Dewey, W.E.B. Du Bois, as well as Gloria Saldua and many others. So if there is a contribution to political philosophy from this side of the pond, it is fundamentally pragmatism, and what does it mean that we've lost some of the foundational gains uh, about pragmatic thought? So mostly for students, I'm going to try to do two things. Share with you some nuance about how we might develop a vocabulary for better understanding what we've inherited. That is, when students oftentimes arrive at universities, and in particular from elite institutions such as American University, they really discover their identity proper really in context of classrooms. They don't see themselves in their communities as necessarily having, say, a Latino identity or a working class identity because these groups are fundamentally homogenous to the degree that we can predict student success by virtue of the zip code from where they come and not necessarily but by what should be me measures that have to do with how educational systems should treat all of us uh, equally uh, in public education. And I can speak a little bit more about that uh, as we move forward. Second, and for students, uh, I just want to, in faculty as well, or staff who are here, please interrupt me if you have a burning question. I'd like to see this as an opportunity to be both formal in terms of delivery, but also engaged in a way that allows me to learn from your experiences so that then I can have a more fortified opportunity to talk about my principal project, which is communicating the current political impasse as we've inherited. So we need only think of the false dichotomies between insider and outsider, documented and so-called illegal, in order to understand uh, this conundrum. So for students, let me share uh, this. And let's see how it's going to work, because I brought the wrong glasses with me. And you know, I, I might have to uh, fudge through this as best I can, so please bear with me. And again, thank you to all of you for the invitation. In September 1968, Congress authorized President Lyndon B. Johnson to proclaim National Hispanic Heritage Week, which was to be observed in mid-December. The observance was expanded in 1988 to a month-long celebration, and Latino advocacy groups renamed it Latino Heritage Month in order to foreground the legacies of the survival of peoples born out of the colonization of the Americas through acts of national remembrance and commemoration. So I understand what students are doing right now in terms of celebrating Latino Heritage Month is a type of act against oblivion, a recovery against the sorts of historical memory that would elide an entire population of people through very complex systems of obfuscation and legally mandated exclusion, which I will address. Befitting survival and remembrance and those generative acts against oblivion, we would do well to recall that the Latino population of the United States is at over 55 million. There are more Latinos in the United States than there are Spaniards in Spain. There are more Latinos in the United States than there are Argentines in Argentina, or Chileans, Paraguayans, and Uruguayans combined. How is it that we don't have a system in place in an institution whose sole purpose is to provide insight into the work of generative democracy in post-enlightenment thought. We need to ask ourselves, what are the conditions that elide the participation of whole populations of people and the largest minority group in the country, surpassing African Americans? We should also remember that of the 55 million plus, 28.5 million are currently eligible to vote. Despite the daunting demographic reality, Latinos are still the most underrepresented group in American institutions and proportionally the least likely to graduate from high school, much less from college, proportionally. If you're a Latino student at this institution, 
Uh, and please raise your hand if you identify as Latino or Latina or Latinx. Thank you for that. Uh, you're actually a unicorn uh, in terms of access to educational equity. Uh, and you, by your very body and presence, do things for the institution that the institution cannot measure adequately. And I hope to elaborate on, on some of this. And you should remember, again, as a Latino student, Latinos in the US are three times more likely to have an arrest record than a high school diploma. Three times more likely. I hope, th I hope this resonates uh, as I share some of these statistics with you. You are proportionally as policed as blacks through institutional systems whose purpose is to make you forget your own humanity. And in the absence of systems in place that support your humanity and your participation in civil society, you must act consistently against uh, this type of oblivion that's institutionalized. The Latinos account for 17.3% of the population. If you are a Latino faculty member, uh, Latino faculty members, self-identify, if you're in a coveted tenure stream position, you represent less than 3% of the entire professoriate, even though the population is upwards of 17.3 million. So the question of proportional representation is complex, but in some respects, relatively simple. What are the conditions that allow for the exclusion of whole bodies of people and the bodies of knowledge that they might transmit in ways that are meaningful to an institution whose primary purpose is proportional representation. I've looked at American University's mission statement, just as I look at the mission statement in my own institution, and there's a particular drive going on, and though it may be unintentional, sometimes it's intentional, about obfuscating lived reality of diversity with the simulacrum of diversity. And you can see this most notably in a lot of brochures, and institutional media where you have the sole African-American faculty member in any given department just grace pages uh, all over the place. And I'm sharing this with you not because I'm cynical, but because I believe in the politics of participation in a way that we could have a conversation and develop the nuance that allows us to respectfully engage about the conditions of why this inclusion has emerged. Along with African-American faculty, you, Latino faculty, are also twice as likely to be more in debt and living paycheck to paycheck than your Anglo-American or Asian-American counterparts. Put most prosaically, education, once the true tried route to social mobility and civic enfranchisement has failed Latinos at most every turn. If this seems hyperbolic, let me gloss just a few examples for you. High concentration Latino heritage states like Texas, Arizona, and many others have recently institutionalized de facto discrimination against Latinos. In Texas, Cesar Chavez and other notable Latinos have been eliminated from the social studies curriculum in public school textbooks. In the particular case of Texas, you have director of the Board of Education for the entire state who homeschools her children and has a particular Christian teleology about what Texas is all about. And this elides, of course, the fundamental conceits that adhere to understanding that the US is fundamentally a Latino country. Whatever we called Latino in the past, we would do well to remember that states like Colorado, Nevada, Utah, parts of Wyoming and Colorado, as well as Texas claim as a free and lone star state in 1836, were part and parcel of Mexico. This doesn't even take into account the Spanish southern territories that extend both from the Caribbean, think of Puerto Rico as a part of the United States, and also Florida, all the way to the Mississippi Basin and New Orleans. How has this come to pass? What has allowed the hollowing of democratic practice in our moment, and not just for Latinos, but for a country premised on deliberative democracy? That is, people coalesce and come together, as, as social scientists will tell you, around common needs. And those common needs might be discrimination against African Americans, women's rights movements, and so forth. So democracy, though messy, 
has opportunities for political emergence. And this is what I refer to when I say that Latino identity is a fiction, and I don't mean that cynically. It would be very difficult to assume that we could have a genetic test for that, although Ancestry.com really obfuscates the tradition <laughs> and turns us, in, wittingly or not, uh, into supporters of a type of ideology that we thought we did away uh, after World War II. What I'd like to do is, from that framing conceit that I've just shared with you, uh, is to talk about the closing of the Democratic Commons. And before I do that, I do need to give you a prehistory, especially for students, as it relates to what is the purpose of American higher education. John Dewey, in particular, a great American pragmatist philosopher, believed that America needed to decide through educational policy whether we were going to inculcate in our youth the systems that we learned in the old world or to instantiate forms of disavowal of authority that are both respectful, messy, and allow us to parse truth from fiction with far more nuance than we're accustomed to. So it is clear, and it should be if you don't uh, know, that American institutions played a fundamental role in the structural transformation of American civic life in the last half of the 20th century by creating greater access to class mobility and opening the democratic commons through education to historically disenfranchised groups. And I pause here because when I speak of diversity, I'm not speaking of the number of Presbyterians and Baptists at AU or anywhere else. I'm speaking of historically marginalized groups that are codified through equal employment opportunity law, and that is a hallmark of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And those groups, as you can imagine, are African Americans, Latino slash Hispanic, we haven't quite worked that out, Asian Americans, and Native Americans. This is deeply problematic because oftentimes, and you may not know this, in IPEDS reporting, and we must do this in institutions who receive 501c3 status, that is they are tax exempt organizations, you have to report whether you're doing your job. If a university has contract with the government, you have to follow equal employment opportunity directives. So when we speak of diversity, meaningful diversity in the context of historical inclusion of the likes that Du Bois, Gloria Saldua, and John Dewey imagined, it's a type of inclusion that has a direct bearing on history and historical antecedent. So let's get that clear uh, from the get-go. The passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act included, included legally mandated inclusion of racialized minorities and the Act's Title VI protections extended access to educational opportunities by prohibiting discrimination against women, minorities, and, and I quote, and I'll only mention some of them, admissions, recruitment, financial aid, discipline, and how it's meted out in the classroom, classroom assignment, grading, educational practices, recreation, athletics, and much more. No longer excluded from the nation's elite institutions, women, for example, began to be admitted to Columbia, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, in ways that altered their political emergence in American civic life in rarefied, rarefied institutions, such as the Supreme Court of the United States. And I'm a little behind on the slides. Again, my glasses. So, so if it doesn't coincide, just raise your hand and say, uh, you know, focus a little more. Title VI also created the conditions that allowed for the entry, albeit proportionately and in more modest numbers, of blacks into American civic life through education and its attendant promise of social mobility. However, and this shouldn't be a surprise, the group least likely to benefit from the Civil Rights Act most generally and Title VI protections in particular were Latinos and we should consider this astounding given the legal distinction by class conferred upon Lat people of Latin American ancestry living in the United States under a little known case and it's unfortunate and that is the 1954 case, no, not the one you're thinking about. This is Hernandez versus Texas. 
perhaps overshadowed by the more prominent 1954 SCOTUS decision, Brown versus the Board of Education, Hernandez v. Texas affirmed that what today we refer to as Latinos must be treated equally under the law, much the same way as blacks were protected under the Constitution's 1868 Equal Protection Clause. So imagine from 68, 1868 to 1954, finally we get to an accounting that shares with us in the public sphere that people of Latin American ancestry in the United States need to have the same protection. It was curious because the case was brought on by LULAC, which was fundamentally a citizen's group, some retired uh, officers from various services, and they were strategically assimilative. They didn't want to call themselves Mexicans. They preferred to call themselves Latin Americans for one fundamental reason. After the end of the US-Mexico War in 1848, people who happened to be Mexican or Latin Americans who were mining in the fields of California, searching for gold, remember Souter's Mill? Those of us that remember civics in high school, those were Chileans. You had Cubans in every major port trying to find distribution centers for knowledge. So it wasn't just Mexican Americans, but by the end of the Mexico US War in 1848, and through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, we basically had a strategic conceit that Kerry McWilliams calls assimilative whiteness or the myth of the Hispanic Southwest. That is, Mexicans feeling encroached upon had one solution to civic enfranchisement, and that is to claim whiteness as the structuring principle from which they understood their world. This meant that they began to lose, at least in elite circles, California, the Californios were referred to this, the Ascenderos in modern day New Mexico as well as Arizona also did this, and created a false version of Hispanicity that tied them to Europe, that was one of the primary things, and two, whiteness as it was understood in the post-reconstruction imaginary in the United States. So when you have folks that believe that Latinos are but a recent intrusion onto the national fold, we need to investigate the conditions under which that history has been elided, in part through assimilative strategies that we now know do not work. In fact, public media always considered them blacks who spoke a different language. And Senator John Calhoun of South Carolina, though he was a vehement expansionist, was very clear on the Senate floor after the passage of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and he said, almost verbatim, I can't recall exactly, but it is unheard of in the history of man to include the colored races on par with the white race. For more than half of Mexico's race is comprised of blacks and indigenous groups. Imagine how structurally an expansionist who wants to go from sea to shining sea, create commerce between the East Coast and the West Coast, this guy Leland Stanford uh, helped a little bit in that regard, how he didn't want to incorporate these territories because it would do something. And students, remember, what is the fundamental question that inheres in the 1860s in the United States? The Civil War. Are these states that are going to be incorporated into the Union, are they going to be fundamentally slave states or are they going to be so-called free states? Those arguments condition the way that the public sphere understood the question of political participation by people of Latin American ancestry in the United States. And I say that at not Mexicans because it just wasn't Mexicans. So let's get that clarity uh, out of the way. This is why Hernandez versus Texas is so fundamentally uh, important. However, exceptions to the rule, even in our moment, and the rule of national exclusion really abound. Let's take Supreme Court Justice, Associate Justice, Sonia Sotomayor, as an example of the exclusion that proves the rule. Her, because her story is a telling case in point. And I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, probably with Sonia Sotomayor's story. If you need a little bit more nuance, I can share that with you. 
uh, but she was born in the Bronx of Puerto Rican parents, Puerto Ricans who by default became United States citizens in 1917 through the Jones Act. And it was a propitious moment in 1970 to make Puerto Ricans citizens through an act of Congress, but not the Constitution so that it could be removed, that citizenship could be removed at will. And it was done so that the US could enter World War I. The greatest casualties in World War I in the first theater of war were the Harlem Hellcats and the Puerto Rican 153 Regiment that was sent with them. So the idea of the Latino body as an exchangeable commodity under capital was central to empire building and central to the colonization of the Caribbean as a point of conjoinment with possible invasion from the Germans in particular or any other superpower. And I'm going to go over various other laws that don't come uh, to bear immediately for our purpose. Indeed, the nomination of Sotomayor onward uh, began to have us uh, admire her in a way that is intelligible in contemporary American culture by making her represent the elusive fulfillment of a seemingly uh, exhausted American dream. The defining feature of this most recent multiculturalist uh, incarnation of the national narrative of uh, inclusion, and I've called this elsewhere the post-Obama American dream, is an instance on reifying ethnic difference as an aesthetic category outside of history. So think about the citizenship status accorded to somebody like Sonia Sotomayor. Can we claim the same thing about border crossers, what we would call cultural citizens? So is it ethical to assume that because she can make it, so can you? And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time explaining why that's important despite her generalized importance in the American public imagination. Coinciding with the first major assaults against affirmative action program in the 1980s during Ronald Reagan's ascendancy, programs from whom the likes of Sonia Sotomayor were the primary beneficiaries, multiculturalism was transformed from a state-sanctioned corrective for the benefit of disenfranchised groups into the aesthetic practice of diversity. That is, the critical reflection of diversity as proof of our ostensibly post-race moment. If blacks fail through educational systems, it's their fault. We see this with Trump's organizer in Ohio, where she says, almost verbatim, they have opportunities that white kids don't have, and they squander it. This is part and parcel of the neoliberal system that we've inherited that has three principal features, privatization, economic efficiency, and personal responsibility. If you fail, it is your fault. In order to be economic efficient, economically efficient, why have tenure when you could hire adjuncts? And privatization, we need to parcel out the work of the university. Consultants now seep every level of university uh, administrations to the greater loss of the democratic common good for reasons that should be obvious. If not, I could uh, speak a little bit more about that. Uh, and let me explain here what I'm calling uh, the aesthetic practice of diversity through this representative figure and her story of exceptional uh, achievement. But first to the particulars, and I think this is important for framing the discussion because I know that we want to identify with Sonia Sotomayor. I know that we want to identify with Obama deporter in chief who's extended protocols in the IMF and the World Bank that are brutal, brutal shock capitalism uh, uh, is the word for uh, political historians. Sotomayor graduates from Princeton in 1972 and from Yale Law in 1979. These signal years mark her story of educational achievement uh, and also serve as exemplary bookends to the history of Latino and Latina educational exclusion. She enters Princeton at the height of quota-driven affirmative action and graduates from one of the country's most prestigious law schools through the merits of her educational attainment, her sheer diligence and intelligence, and let's be clear about this too, through the agencies of legally mandated quota 
driven affirmative action, much of which she has herself spoken about at length, especially in her best-selling uh, memoir, My Beloved World, published by Knopf in 2013, where she got a $2.1 million advance that allowed her to pay her debt. She, at the time, was the most indebted associate justice to ever serve on the Supreme Court. And public media talked about why she couldn't save any money, because she had gold hoop earrings, she had unnecessary taste in hairdos uh, that bordered on the mari matcha stereotype that some of you might recognize if you're familiar with that pejorative. However, that very year where she graduates from Yale Law in 79 also marked the end of the civil rights era's quota reparative affirmative action that had actually helped to secure her success. There's a picture, I should have shown it before, you know who she is. The Bakke case uh, that ended quota-driven affirmative action effectively ushered in the managerial neoliberal moment in the academy at a time when underrepresented groups were making modest strides into America, American civic life through education. The Bakke case itself reframed legally mandated inclusion along the lines of white racial grievance and of meritocracy as the only educational standard to aspire to. And in ethnic studies, we call this the ecumenical standard. That is that if you're black, white, brown, man, woman, if you get hit over the head by a baseball bat, it's going to hurt the same way. It's our common humanity. It doesn't take into account that blacks and Latinos and queers get hurt over the head with far more regularity, with limited repercussions from the state. So there, there's a whole complex way of understanding philosophical thought and the ecumenical standard. And for students, that becomes a useful frame from which to understand some of the invectives that you will oftentimes hear about all racial grievance that comes from underrepresented groups as fundamentally the the result of your shortcomings. You're too sensitive. We were talking about this before. You need help. We're going to send you to the counseling center. It was just a joke. Boys will be boys, whether they throw banana peels at students who happen to be African American or not. This is fundamentally antithetical to the cause-effect relationship that we need to establish, because as soon as we factor in intent, we assume that we can know the ontological interiority of individuals, and we can't. Ethnic studies, as a method for understanding Latino studies, is about resultant action. I don't care what anybody intended, I care about the consequences of those actions. So from uh, Mr. Brock at Stanford, uh, who was released from a Title IX case resulting in forcible digital penetration, and the judge lets him off because he was just a kid. You can't ruin his career without taking into account what this does to the cisgendered woman who has to contend with this and then fight an entire system that's premised on protecting. And the in loco parentis notion of American higher education is part of No Child Left Behind. So we're supposed to protect our students. And that, that is fundamentally messed up too, but, but, but let's see who gets protected. I think the evidence at hand tells us that we have a problem. Because of the Bakke case that legally reframed uh, inclusion along racial grievance, admissions to colleges and universities from that moment on uh, would principally be limited to merit, as if somehow educational equity were itself the a priori condition for the educational standard in the country. In other words, it presupposes that if you're in public education and you're in a school in Anacostia, it's, you have the same chances as somebody in Chevy Chase, Maryland. This is highly problematic because it creates yet another ecumenical standard that is false and we don't have a system in place to actually articulate that in the public sphere. And that's what Latino intellectual, intellectuals should be focusing on and not how to name their political projects. And I'm sorry, this is gonna be offensive to some people, 
but the expenditure of labor that goes into asserting that we must call Latinos and Latinas Latinx is problematic. One, it evades the language question. The assumption that language don't have any sort of grammatical rules that we need to think through when we want respect not only for people but for their cultural ancestry. I can talk a little bit more about this. I know that for some folks it's very meaningful and also very practically for search terms. How are you going to be cited as a Latino scholar when LexisNexis hasn't figured out the conditions under which you can register? There's a lot of other reasons, but it is part of what I'm calling in this larger project the syndrome related to the fountain of Lourdes, where you take a term, you dip it into Lourdes, and it comes out clean and refreshed. Again, it's an aesthetic predisposition as opposed to legally mandated inclusion. In the Grundrisse, Marx called this Arbeit sans Phrase, that is, labor without speech. We labor consistently to conform to an identity that is really actually identification, which I'll speak about in a second, rather than engage the political heavy work of directing our energies, and we're human, and we're porous, and we have limited opportunities for engaging our projects. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't want my colleagues to focus on this, to write about this, because we need a multi-pronged approach to be able to create civic enfranchisement norms in meaningful ways. But I know that you're going to hate me for that, but whatever. Uh, give me reasons to, to you know, re change my mind again. Uh, that is part of the democratic commons, by the way. Reason, argument, establishing cause-effect relations, and resultant action. What results when all our energies are about creating safe spaces in a system that isn't safe. You can't go into a classroom and expect to be safe. If you do that, logically speaking, you must respect the white racist and give them safe spaces, when actual engagement requires a series of discomforts that are right now collusive through the politics of the safe space campaign. I know that's controversial too, Apologies, I don't mean to upset sensitivities. If you don't agree, all the more reason for you to stay, I would, uh, I would, I would suggest. In other words, such a view has largely held that there are no educational disparities in varying school systems. The subtending legal fictions that have emerged around so-called reverse discrimination have regrettably not met, been met with reasoned resistance in either the press or the academy. On the contrary, it would not be an exaggeration to state that universities have largely been complicit in the closing of the democratic imagination, the perpetuation of a tiered democracy, and in abnegating their professed values as articulated in their mission statements through diversity capitalism. All universities have mission statements. They tell us what a university does, and their value statements tell us what they value. All universities value diversity. The question is, how are they framing diversity? Is it Protestants and Jehovah's Witnesses? Is it more Republicans because all professors are liberal? Or is it legally mandated inclusion or whatever is left of it in the Democratic Commons through EEO imperatives? Again, Latino, Hispanic, African Americans, who else? Students, tell me. I want to see if you're protected categories under the law. Latino, Hispanic, Native American, Asian American, and the most underrepresented group of all, Native Americans, subjected to tribal colleges and a series of other displacements that are fascinating in and of themselves. So diversity capitalism is a term that I would like uh, to share with you that might be useful as a starting point for conversation with administrators and with your own professors, if you're students, and certainly with administrators of your faculty. Diversity capitalism refers to the ways that predominantly white serving institutions derive value from non-white racial identity. This process flows from the academy's social and legal preoccupation with diversity as a way to manage limited proportional representation of historically disenfranchised groups. In the absence of legally mandated affirmative action, 
white-serving institutions extend diversity into, one, curricular initiatives such as non-Western course requirements, two, an institutionalized global curricular focus, three, in the attempt to diminish contradictions between their professed mission statement and the lack of corporal diversity on campus by practicing diversity bloating. And let me step back and explain what diversity bloating is. You may not know this, but the numbers that we have about students from underrepresented groups come from self-designation. Students in their applications write uh, white, Latino, Hispanic. They use the same EEO categories. They've now added, at least Carnegie Tier 1 institutions, multiracial, because all of a sudden identification is working in that regard. I think that's generally healthy, but it's problematic because you have very wealthy, for example, Latin American students who have no identification whatsoever with Latinos. They get counted, in fact, they deride Latinos as unable to speak the languages from the countries from which they emerge, and they see much the same way that Mexican Americans and Latin Americans in the US did in the 19th century, the expedience of assimilating quickly because economic efficiency dictates it. If you want to get the right internships, you wear the Oxford button down, you use the continental English accent, and you distance yourself from Latinos who are generally the first in their families to go to college. That is one of the most insidious problems that we've inherited in the academy, to count wealthy Latin Americans as if they were part of the historical processes that have led to our current problematic in the democratic commons. Indeed, and I go back to Sonia Sotomayor, shortly after she graduated from Yale, we begin to see a rise in curricular multicultural office uh, offerings at top research one institutions and elite liberal art colleges. I can cite the research on this uh, and the numbers, but my time is limited and I want to bore you. While the actual numbers of combined black and Latino students diminished at elite institution during the 80s and well into the 90s. And this was particularly true in one of the first institutions to encounter this through various propositions in California, and that was the University of California at Berkeley, where the numbers automatically uh, dipped. In other words, the same policies that allowed for quota-driven systems, you might recall from the slide, and in the Bakke case, the University of California, Davis, had only allotted 16 potential spots. In other words, every year they didn't get 60 minority applicants. They allotted up to that. What a remedy to a history of exclusion. Who wins? Baki wins. And the justice who wrote the majority opinion, Justice Powell, was a vehement segregationist who ran the school board in Richmond, Virginia, and resented the integration of blacks with whites. So when we think of justice as measured and temper, the evidence at hand, not the intention, I'm sure Justice Powell was a very nice man in his imagination, but the end result is what we must continually focus on. We use the same systems of assessment that the neoliberal system in place demands of us and our student evaluations. Are you pleasing your students? Are you writing in a way that allows them to thrive? So they use and co-opt language of thriving and personal growth to ends that are sumamente complicadas. O sea, fundamentalmente immoral desde mi punto de vista. And I want to go back to the idea of white serving institutions because we've also eliminated the possibility of calling a spade a spade. We have Hispanic serving institution and the government designates these as institutions that have either 25% or more Latinos slash Hispanic. You already know the problem with that, Latino slash Hispanic. Conflating the two, two different animals. Spain, Iberia, colonial project, Latinos, colonization, a decolonial project. So 
methodologically, it is not only wrong and silly, it's etymologically useless to conflate the two, but these are the terms that we've inherited and we must work with. Let's remember Foucault, History of Sexuality, chapter two, where he says, there is no outside of power. Activists don't exist free of the systems that confine them. We must figure out a way to play in the game or what Nestor Garcia Canclini called las estrategias para entrar y salir de la modernidad, the strategies for stepping in and out of modernity's binds and incomplete promises. And we must live those incomplete promises to the best of our limited abilities. I want to go back to Sonia. Indeed, shortly after Sotomayor graduated, we began to see the rise of multiculturalism that I shared. The problem is one of proportional representation uh, and was exacerbated uh, in the 80s through diversity capitalism. We all have a sense of what diversity capitalism is. Do you have examples here at the institution? I have examples at my institution where administrators tout all sorts of diversity and, and as I mentioned before, they put images of diverse students that all of a sudden find themselves perplexed to be in institutional brochures. What does this do when they arrive on campus? What are the ethical contradictions that adhere to a false promise of inclusion? How do we explain it? The neoliberal recourse to personal responsibility. We've opened up our doors. Through our largesse, we're bringing you in, we're giving you money. No conditions for thriving. And that is central to the conditions for thriving that majoritarian students, mostly white, but not always, receive in terms of junior getting training in, for preschool preparation, junior and extracurriculars, ballet classes for the cisgendered and gender conforming, not to mention the expensive SAT or ACT tests that condition a version of success based on merit when we are deluding ourselves based on the evidence before us. This is a central problem in a crisis uh, of crisis proportions, I would argue. The crisis of proportional representation in democratic institutions and the assault on the shrinking democratic commons exacerbated in American higher education from the 80s onward through diversity capitalism has been described pejoratively as the corporatization of the university or more simply the rise of the neoliberal university. And we see examples in Thatcherite England when all of a sudden you begin to have centers of excellence. They do away with their version of tenure. And if you're not producing X amount of graduates bringing in X amount of money, you're canned, you can't teach. Oh well, find yourself another career, free market capitalism. For Christopher, Christopher Newfield and other scholars, the neoliberal university emphasizes, as I mentioned, privatization, economic efficiency, and personal responsibility. To, and I don't wanna be cynical, but I find myself as I'm saying this out loud, because I, I planned on being informal in my sharing this with you, and I'm beginning to sound kind of sour. Uh, at least to my ear, and that's not my nature. My nature is to think through effective democracy in fundamentally optimistic ends, otherwise the alternative would deplete me completely and make me, uh, make me a heavy drinker, more than I am. The costs uh, of this are astounding. For example, universities whose principal responsibility has been as wisdom keepers turn to credential givers and transform students from wisdom seekers to credential seekers. Uh, in my university, the tape is playing, so I'll use another example. There are universities right now that their major mantra is from the classroom to the boardroom. What happens to socially conscious students who begin to do the work of the state when they graduate working for nonprofits, serving as legal interpreters in a carceral system designed to prevent Latinos from progressing. And it's significant to note that out of the 55 million, 63 are documented or legal residents. So when we inherit this idea that the only Latino question is about immigration, 
it's a falsehood that you, dear students, need to begin to counter with clarity and with example. If not, we've lost the possibility for political inclusion. Even, think about this, even if you're the most recalcitrant racist, even if you hate blacks, hate Latinos, hate queers, Southeast Asians, generally Asians from certain countries are given complementary white status, but if you look at the graduation numbers of Southeast Asians, they actually are commensurate with blacks and Latinos. So we need to be more nuanced too about what we mean by Asians. They completely evacuate the possibility for having a clear dialogue about inclusion that is meaningful. As I mentioned, the singular contribution of American higher education and its foundational ties to democratic pragmatism through educational practice these scholars who criticize the neoliberal university contend, lead us to the spectral politics of the day where reasoned argument and truth are the principal victims of our political moment. It is perhaps this reason that a Pew Foundation study found that 29% of white Americans believed in, sup in the supernatural and ghosts, while only 16% of white Americans believed that there was discrimination against blacks. What kind of political moment have we inherited? <laughs> I, I, would, I would concur. Uh, and I would like to know about the sample size, and I've asked uh, my friend Hugo at the Pew, because it's, it's amazing that we can believe in the most inane and ridiculous things. Okay, I'm from the Caribbean, so I shouldn't say that, right? Because even though I kind of don't believe, lo repito. But we need to think, what is this inheritance that has moved us to a moment where the practicality of a magical realist world, magical thinking that we inhabit, is more plausible than blacks or Latinos or others suffering discrimination? What we do with this impasse, what do we do with this impasse in democratic uh, practice in the attendant rise of racism in an ostensibly post-racial country? Can the field of Latino studies invigorate democratic practice in the face of massive demographic changes in a radically transformed higher education system? I'm going to provide some suggestions on the legacies of Latino thought that have emerged that might provide a framework to think through this in ways that allow us to use a common nomenclature that we can all understand, not highfalutin critical language, which is the problematic of the culture wars in the 80s and the 90s, where we were so concerned about versions and continental philosophy that we let tenure slip through our fingers while we had the likes of Mr. Bloom claiming the closing of the American mind because all of a sudden we were teaching Toni Morrison uh, and lesser poets. Uh, and, but look what a ruse that is. The immediate turn was to defend why Toni Morrison was important, and I believe that she is, but not to understand why affirmative action in this country had worked for approximately 400 years at the benefit of white men who had access to educational opportunities in ways that women didn't until the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Students, remember, there's a reason that Barnard College existed because women could not go to Columbia. There is a reason that Radford uh, College uh, existed because women could not go to Harvard. There's a reason that women went to Bryn Mawr and not Penn because th these were training women in classical philology and in Greek and Latin in ways that would prepare them to be intelligent housewives to uh, their husbands that would graduate down the road, whether it was a pen, whether it was Columbia. Nobody has a problem with that. Nobody has a problem that affirmative action has benefited a particular race and a particular gender for the course of this country's founding and actually up until the present with the elision of affirmative action and quota system. So can Amer uh, American democratic experiment uh, reconcile class, racial, gender, and ethnic particular particularisms to generative ends? Our historical moment is sadly responding in unsatisfying ways, as it would appear by the vitriol associated with uh, the Trump campaign 
and the misogyny directed against Hillary Clinton uh, in ways that would be astounding even 20 years ago, the way that this course uh, is, is emerging. Yet one of our most prescient thinkers, the late Jose Esteban Munoz, proposed a potential way, a potential way out of our impasse in an incomplete project about the political importance of what he called the here and now a queer futurity in his last work, Cruising Utopia. And what he means by queer is non-normative. That certainly includes gender expression, but not exclusively. Can we queer politics to the degree that it lives up to his promise was his central preoccupation. Cruising Utopia extended Munoz's work from his important book, Disidentifications, Queers of Color, and the Performance of Politics. Has anybody heard about these books? Right, so some of you are, are familiar uh, with, with these books, so I, I won't uh, summarize uh, most of it. In the direction of what he called the Brown Commons Project. This third project, the Brown Commons Project, borrowed from an emergent Black Lives Matter movement and tried to find intersectional points of contact with black struggles along with brown struggles. The project was taking shape in his unfinished book, variously called in conferences Brown Affect. That was supposed to be his third contribution, although elsewhere it appears as a sense of brown. If you look online and you search for Brown Affect in your library, you're going to see various articles that would have formed the basis for uh, this book. It would have provided the third anchor in a type of work that is fundamentally informed, and bear with me here, by the importance of beauty as justice. I really miss him. From Munoz's prolific work in essays, conferences, presentations, and bar crawl conversations of which I was a part of and still very happy to recall, we can piece together what he might have described as a method for reformulating the also unfinished business of democratic inclusion. What I hear outlined to my left uh, is a point of departure for framing the conditions under which just inclusion might be delimited rather than instantiated if we aren't attuned to the tools of our own subjection. So he insisted fundamentally in many of his later pieces that we can't defer, as we would in a neoliberal moment or in a Christian theological move, perfection or beauty for the future. We have to instantiate it in whatever pockets we live in our moment. Whether it's crazy, fantastic sex that brings you alive in ways that you can't even imagine through someone that rocks your mind and your world, to the possibility for political inclusion that actually sees beauty as a central conceit. And I'd like to uh, explain what I mean by beauty as justice in a second, because he was following a particular line of continental philosophy that most of us would say, ooh, dude, really, don't focus uh, on that. And we would say, Latin Americans would say to him, why are you so worried about continental philosophy? He answered that question uh, with clarity when he said, if this work is to be read and be meaningful, we have to use the tools that those who have the potential to transform structures of feeling and of thought and of inclusion in ways that translate. He was doing what translators call transposition. You have to transpose a vocabulary in order to insert yourself in circuits of power. He worked through three fundamental tiers of thinking, uh, and I'd like to go through these with you. I'm going to uh, spare you the, uh, the detailed description because I think I can do this uh, from memory. Identity for him and for practitioners of a new ethnic studies related to the Brown Commons project is fundamentally regulated by the state. So for example, when you write on the census form, you're a man, woman, uh, single, uh, black, Hispanic, slash Latino, or any other configuration thereof, you establish a relationship to the state. Students, why would the state be interested in you defining that relationship to the state? Resources are allotted by virtue of those types of identification. So when we have identification and students say, I am not, my colleagues, people in my family, I am not Latino or Hispanic. I am just going to call myself white because that's how I understood myself in my country. 
think how problematic that is. In the Dominican Republic, there is in their passports no category for black. You're only Indio or white. Look at the heavy weight of state identity formation in a country next to Haiti like the Dominican Republic. So again, and for students, identification refers to, do you consider yourself a goth, queer? Uh, I'm a, somebody who considers themselves a uh, vineyard vines. We see some of these in our classrooms. It's an identity, preppy, that they sort of carry. The state isn't as interested in regulating that because personal expression is part of the neoliberal drive. If it is efficient for you to buy fashions, and I'm sort of reducing the argument, fashions that approximate you to a version of yourself that Barbara Kruger uh, would describe in the 80s as, I think, therefore I shop, that is not incommensurate with neoliberal inclusion. In fact, the state's not so worried about that. This is the moment that we've inherited right now. This identification. What happens when rural, poor, working class whites or others say Muslim Americans who are tired of the racial baiting that is going on cannot even believe in their identity as, say, Muslim or believe that the state protection as Middle Eastern or whatever the category is, would protect them, they begin to identify, mostly online, uh, research tells us, with insurgent groups and a type of terrorism that allows them then to create an identity based on resistance to what they see as patriarchal. They wouldn't describe it this way, of course, but state-sanctioned modes of oppression. So terror is fundamentally about making others experience pain in a way that resonates vis-a-vis -vis identification with your own perceived suffering or the suffering of those that you identify with. So students, again, when we say my identity, what you're really saying, it's a state formation. What most students generally refer to is identification. That is, how do they self-define? Cisgendered queer, <coughs> preppy, et cetera. You get that? So what would be the problem with disidentification? What is the moment where we can't trust the political process in Congress assembled to even pass laws that actually do the job that they're supposed to do, and then have political figureheads that we begin to identify with? White nationalist Trump. Oh, he gets me. He gets the way that whites are victims of reverse discrimination. This is our moment. The Brown Project's work is fundamentally interested in figuring out how to find intersectional work that brings a type of justice to this horrible inheritance. And I, and I don't think I'm exaggerating. I don't think I've ever felt more politically depressed. I came to this country when I was eight years old. I've never seen the vitriol directed against my own family. I happen to be lighter. Folks in my family are darker. Driving while brown, the number of documented US citizens are commensurate with the numbers of undocumented citizens being arrested and not allowed to go through due, due process. Uh, the statistics are there. I can share them with you. Do we talk about this in the public sphere? No. We delimit the possibilities for political emergence through modes of identification which is actually really interesting in the US because it emerges from uh, Emerson onward. In his book, Representative Men, he talked about how we should model representative American individuation and individualism by virtue of examples from classical antiquity and not necessarily Europe at that particular moment for reasons, just like in Latin America, you wouldn't identify with Spain at any particular moment of independence or beyond because it just wouldn't make sense for independence purposes. So the complicated uh, Michigas that we've inherited uh, is considerable. So I'd like to move to uh, a conclusion uh, for you. Uh, and thank you for your patience so far. Uh, but I want to share a slide that, uh, that I hope isn't too disturbing, but is very much about uh, issues that have emerged recently uh, at AU. We had a series of student protests based on what 
the blogosphere is deridingly calling the banana incident and related incidents that emerged. And I'm assuming that you're familiar uh, with uh, this particularly complicated uh, moment. Uh, when I first saw this um, on Wusa 9, uh, I got a little choked up because I see leadership exhibited by students, not necessarily by administrators, who, and this is important, not by faculty who are beholden to administrators for renewal of contracts or for tenure protections. So look how we have been imbricated in a system of power that then makes students the primary reason why they have to become responsible for the inheritance of public and private education in this country. And we should remember the, the moral act of 1862 ensured the great land grant state system. That is, the state had a role in making sure that all its citizens, as many as could get in, were educated. You wanted a fledgling democracy that would eventually be strong. And the only way that you did that was through education. What later has been called education as a practice uh, of freedom. When our discourse is so impoverished that a gentle, valiant kid, young person can say, I am more than your quota. We are hearkening back to a version of inclusion that doesn't even exist. Where is the possibility for the professoriate and administrators to have the type of curricular inclusion that's not on a potential campus in Abu Dhabi, hybrid courses that are going to privatize your university and many others in particular ways, but in meaningful engagement that allows us to parse truth from fiction in more uh, ways with more nuance that we're accustomed to. So I'd like to conclude with an invocation that might sound kind of weird, but I think it's necessary at a particular moment. And remember the language that I use about Jose Esteban Munoz wanting to speak the language of inclusion and of cultural participation in ways that would resonate rather than exclude. And it's totally calculated and it's strategic to the umph degree. Diotima of Manatea told Socrates, who later told Plato, that the greatest gift the gods bequeathed to humans was the gift of beauty. Diotema distinguished between natural and artifactual beauty because natural beauty found in the heavens and nature could be recreated. Artifactual beauty could be reproduced with hands and with our imagination. Diotema's line of beauty was structured around mathematical balance. Artifactual beauty reproduces nature's symmetry, she told Socrates, and from it our most enduring and imperfect image of beauty, justice. We inherit this in various courts where you have the figure of the woman with a blindfold holding the scale for balance. It comes from this tradition completely associated with beauty. Justice, the simile is important. Justice as beauty. The Western tradition misinterpreted to ruin a sense by academic postmoderns, sorry kids, who helped us lose the culture war of the 80s and 90s the same tradition that brought us the heights of the Baroque as well as the depravity of chattel slavery in the black Atlantic slave trade offers us a Trojan horse we neglect at our own peril. Justice in its most recent iteration, beautiful, perfectible, messy, sometimes ugly democracy. The greatest, though certainly most fallible corrective to the absence of beauty is law. And no, I'm not referring to, referring to personal injury uh, lawyers that's, uh, or the Black Lives Matter, uh, the All Lives Matter movement. That is a perverted form of beauty. And I use the word as a way that adheres to conviviality, what Foucault called the ethics of the care of the self. We must care for ourselves in the way that we care for others because only then do we become fulfilled in the only system that we have for what I'm here calling political emergence and for him was ways of being in the world. I believe that Munoz actually called this from Cruising Utopia, the here and now of queer futurity. The campus managerial class is now international as Stephen Saliada has reminded us, and you might be familiar with that case where he gets hired at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, 
uh, because some uh, donors to the university and board of trustee members have a problem with this politics. The contract is rescinded, and the Mishigas that uh, ensued, I'm, I'm using my grandmother's uh, Yiddish far more than I should, but we're seeing the three pillars of the neoliberal university dictate at colleges decision-making as well as the allocation of resources that are increasingly monopolized in the service of donors, politicians, board of trustee members, corporations, defense contractors, and frankly, sensationalistic media. We can't properly understand the form and function of freedom without also understanding political power. So how would she re we respond as students, as professors, as citizens or cultural citizens? The basic goal of critical education is to interrogate the sacrosanct and the consecrated. But no theory is worth anything if it doesn't put us in a better position to erad eradicate injustice. No pedagogy is worth employing if it doesn't help students and ourselves understand the transformative power of beauty. The legacy of the liberal arts gives us the frame for understanding that, and it is part of our historical legacy, whether we like it or not. Insofar as the neoliberal university treats justice as a potential threat to brand equity, let's not get that out in the media that students are protesting race. That's going to ruin our brand. Let's be very careful about that. We must then seek the transformation of the university in the image of a consonant, just, unrelenting version of beauty. In the field of Latino studies, the late comer to academic institutionalization, I think has the thing to teach us about inclusion that we would ignore uh, at our peril. Thank you. Thank you for the question, and uh, especially coming from uh, a student in gender and sexuality studies, uh, which is what you study. So thank you. <coughs> There's a particular political moment that we've inherited that has more to do with substituting culture for the politics of the state than of state protections that can allow us to truly reap democratic enfranchisement. So broadly speaking, and help me think through this too, because I can't possibly know the attachments that students would have about this in a way that resonates with students. I'm a little too old for that, so I need your help uh, in figuring this out as well. When we speak of the possibilities for inclusion, do we have the energy to do that, make a living, and actually transform the institution from within in a way that allows us to be strategic and in measure with the limited time that we have in this world. This is particularly important for students because administrators are responsive to students in ways that they're not to faculty. But what is the shelf life, if you're lucky, of a student? Four years. Once you reinvent a tradition what is the next best thing that's going to happen? Think of, for those of us old enough to remember, how Latina slash Latino became in certain circles Latinois. In other words, that's how we pronounced it at a particular moment in time, because we wanted to be inclusive of genders. Two things happen when we include Latinx at the expense of a very gendered, misogynist language. One, it lets language off the hook through rules that we make up on our own. Two, we let monolingual English speakers get off the hook for adding an O or perhaps an X 
to every word that sounds in English. In other words, if one demands cultural affirmation, which certainly should be part of a liberationist project, might it be more useful to demand that language actually transforms not psyche, not interiority, but what I'm here calling identification? Is it useful to be so beholden, and, and I don't mean to be aggressive with this line of thinking, is it useful to be so beholden to our own subjection that we demand that we be treated through nomination that has limited relationship to the state for a performative category that is fundamentally aesthetic? I don't have an answer uh, to that. And as you think through it and help me think through it, I would be happy if we started an email exchange so that I can better understand it. Because it would be unfair for me to assume that I've convinced you. And it would be unfair for me to assume how important this is for you. And out of fundamental respect that I hope to model and that I hope I'm doing right now, I want to know what is important, aside from the, the things that I can imagine, when we have an understanding in the US that language is a foreign, that Spanish is a foreign language. If we continue to assume that distance and we create a bridge for others to understand our identifications with limited access to state identity formation, are we doing a service to those with the most to lose? When I go home to my family, I'm the first person in my family to graduate from college, if I demanded to be called by how I identify at every turn, and I have to be strategic about this, I would limit the possibility for creating beauty in the world that gives them some satisfaction and gives me fundamental pain because I would like to share my identifications with them. But the here and now of queer futurity, for me, as I understand it in my limited way, is about a type of conviviality that is not about acquiescing, but simply about holding off on what I can and demanding what I must have, respect for me and my queer partner. I could go to various configurations of Latinois, Latinx, but I've chosen not to. But I want to understand student investment in this. If you would uh, help me with an email exchange. Or even visiting Juliana's class, who's been so <laughs> instrumental in so many people's lives about, about this project. And I know that that's unsatisfactory, and I'm sorry about that. But, but it's as earnest as I can make it. An institution cannot disagree with you on their published institutional mission. Let me show you AU's mission statement. The problem is how they go about it, I think. How you get to this. Okay. Point, right? I, I'm trying to think with you here. So part of the mission statement of the university is participation in university governance. What does that mean when your faculty is mostly adjunctified and on continuing lines. Equity and equal access and appreciation of diverse cultures and viewpoints. My question would be, can you turn portions of that statement to generative ends through data? And the fundamental data warehouse that we have for educational statistics is the National Center for Educational Statistics that requires iPads reporting. The national numbers are very clear. Elite institutions have attracted approximately 24.7% of the 
of underrepresented groups at the rank of assistant professor. I would want to know the number of assistant professors, tenure stream and continuing, and separate them, disaggregate them, and go to the administration with that singular question. Are we living up to our mission and who we say that we are when our peers have far exceeded their ability to attract and retain? That's one, one point of entry. The administrative speak is going to be, much the same way as it is with students, we're going to have a commission to study this, if you're lucky. We're going to study this, and they defer action until the person who is the gadfly and the squeaky wheel is either so disaffected or has gotten so angry that those few emails that they send somehow become public, they become discredited, and then you enter the next cycle of engagement with administrative structures. I'm being cynical because I see this happen all the time. How could you not be mildly crazy in a system that is so schizophrenic where you're passing as an underrepresented faculty member, as someone who makes kind of the same as a graduating student who goes to IT uh, or IT programs? So the mission statement must be put to generative ends, and you do that through the very tools that the university uses, not to tenure faculty of color. Uh, there are many conversations, and I just came back from the Center for Faculty Diversity, where we talked about how student evaluations are destroying intellectual life for students and for faculty. In other words, in what other system can you go to, I don't know, say your doctor, hey, I don't like the diagnosis of viral pneumonia. You're going to change it. That's the equivalent of grade grubbing. No other system uh, allows for that, other than Yelp, but the repercussions aren't the same. So when you have dedicated amount of time to get tenure, and you have systems in place that aren't questioned, now they will always ask for another commission to study student evaluations. One can counter that by going not only to the Center for Educational Statistics, but to the Harvard Coach Survey on Faculty Satisfaction and what peer institutions say about mentoring at that particular institution. There are three fundamental responsibilities that institutions have to faculty, whether they're tenure track or not. One, procedural mentoring. Two, intellectual mentoring. Three, professional mentoring. Procedural mentoring means that when you arrive, they better tell you what constitutes a solid syllabus, the number of pages the students are expected to read, any other information that's germane to both the department and the school. Schools are different. That procedural mentoring falls on the responsibility of your chair. All faculty handbooks have that because they follow AAUP guidelines. If you, hypothetically, not you, but you, you the you plural, haven't been mentored, haven't been given a mentoring plan, and you get a third year review that's less than happy, you need to show evidence where have you abrogated your responsibility as department chair. Now that takes cojones. But one thing, or ovaries, one thing that matters significantly is a truism that we need to figure out. And that is, tenure does not give you courage. Courage gives you courage. And you do that through building alliances with colleagues who are tenured and who've survived it, and you get ready a series of potential letters that should go in the right direction if people don't do their job. So that's another element. Think about how procedural mentoring, even if you had it and it worked well, could fundamentally fail if you don't have intellectual mentoring. You're at a small school. Let's say you hire a colleague who's fantastic and area of specialization is uh, old church Slavonic. Who the heck in your department is going to be able to read your articles or understand your work? Institutions are responsible through faculty development initiatives to find links either at other institutions with senior scholars who will help you with that, your particular linguistics question if you're in that field, your particular historical question if you're in that field, so that then you get to professional mentoring. That is, by the time you submit the peer review article, you already have 
scholars with tenure, often at R1s, who know your name and your work because you've vetted it with them. The idea of mentoring, and this is central to faculty success, irrespective of tenure track or tenure ladder status, is intellectual mentoring and a plan for intellectual mentoring. So there are ways to talk about that that doesn't put you in the position, and I use the Fro Freudian term of the hysteric. Hysterical reaction is natural in the face of contradictions that you're asked to live. It's like somebody telling you, uh, no, it's not raining, and somebody's peeing on you. No, you're peeing on me, and not because I want to. So this is highly problematic, but we need to develop familiarity with faculty handbook standards. We need to familiarize ourselves with AAUP guidelines and hold administrators accountable. And the other thing, let me just say, when you have fantastic faculty with tenure who refuse to be department chairs and put the responsibility on juniors or who refuse to join major committees and wash their hands of it because they've done their duty, they're abnegating their duty. They are not doing the job that they're supposed to. You know why? because career administrations that don't come from the faculty are going to go in in their place, and that is precisely what's happened in the US after the late 90s. When I got my PhD at Maryland in 1999, 63% of all academic jobs, not counting uh, community colleges, were either tenure or tenure track. Right now, it's less than 23%. Less than 23%. How did that happen? Really smart, but fundamentally careless, unthinking, tenured faculty who should have been having fights, not about identificatory practices or Lacan is the way to go in the orientation of my department. That might be interesting, but that is not going to solve the relationship of democracy to forms of leadership that need to be modeled. That is called anti-mentoring. So this is the fundamental problematic. Turn the tools of subjection and, and you'll never win by just using the master's tools. Audre Lorde was very clear about this. But you need the language to turn it on its head. Think of it as a Baroque problem and thought. The Baroque was masterful. If you can't discuss colonial enterprises, you create an aesthetic architecture to ostentate Spanish imperial beauty because you're failing. The empire is coming apart. What do you do? Aesthetic representation, life of the saints, beautiful sculpture, gold-plated realia, even fancier outfits. We can't use culture as a substitute for the work of the state. And one way to do that is to turn those stories to different purposes. Um, well, we, uh, we ran out of time, so <laughs> thank you so much, Lassen. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Thank all of you for it. And for students, if you have any questions, please email me so I can share some data with you if you need to, and faculty uh, as well. Thank you for the opportunity.